Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Eldad Prahia. I am now at uh, Aruba HPE, and I was asked to give a talk on, you know, to give everyone a sneak peek at the next major amendment coming to dot .11, which we're going to call 11AX. So in around 2013, uh, while we were wrapping up uh, 802.11ac, we started looking forward to what problems were we were uh, facing with uh, existing Wi-Fi networks and what we thought we were going to face um, in, in uh, future networks. So we were getting reports that with a, uh, you know, uh, networks were still having a preponderance of short data frames, and we, you know, we weren't capable of aggregating those frames like we did with 11N, 11AC, so it was still causing a lot of uh, efficiency hit. We were seeing networks like this, which you have really dense deployments, so uh, again, different than, say, perhaps um, the more modern enterprise uh, or home networks that were less dense. So we wanted to look at that. Uh, again, with dense deployments, um, overlapping BSSs uh, were impacting potential increase in, in uh, capacity, so we wanted to look at features that perhaps would unlock that uh, capability. And with the whole discussion of 5G and you know, so forth, we wanted to be more competitive with outdoor cellular. Uh, so, so there was an you know, aspect of the group that wanted to uh, you know, purposefully address outdoor So from that, um, through 2013, 2014, the study group came up with a list of goals for what would be the 802.11ax task group. Uh, we were going to enhance operation in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. As we all know, 11ac was only in 5 gigahertz, so we haven't had a major enhancement at 2.4 uh, since 11n. So we were going to uh, go back and actually improve, try to improve uh, uh, 2.4 gigahertz as well as best as we could. Still, you know, major focus is on 5 gigahertz, but we're not excluding 2.4 this time around. Uh, 11N and 11AC focus on throughput, on you know, aggregate throughput. Uh, you can always trick this by, you know, if you have 100 clients, you can turn, you can just not serve 99, 99 of them, serve one client, and you can get really high aggregate throughput. Um, but that doesn't give you very good average throughput across the BSS or the cell, right? So, so we're going to focus on, on uh, average throughput per station. Uh, we're going to try to get 4x. Uh, I'll, hopefully we're going to have enough features in 11ax to do that. We're going to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, look at environments indoor and outdoor this time. And we're going to have a wide range of scenarios that are, we're seeing a lot of dense deployment. So, you know, increase in density in a corporate office, outdoor hotspot, uh, apartment buildings where you have uh, you know dense uh, deployments in you know nearby you know nearby uh, residential and stadiums. You know, stadiums are you know we're, we're seeing a lot of Wi-Fi deployment stadiums, and those are really problematic. Uh, and as usual, any major amendment, we try to improve the you know power efficiency uh, at the clients. Okay, so before I actually get anything technical, most people ask, when's this coming out? So I'm going to start with the slide of when it's coming out. Um, so I did two things here. I, I have the official timeline, um, and to just see how much, you know, how fantiful, fantiful that is, I actually put the 11AC timeline. Um, so we, we had a, uh, the task group kickoff in May 2014. For 11AX, we did things a little different. There was a, you know, each, each amendment, 11A, 11AC, there was a special interest group uh, got together and started brainstorming. Uh, you see in 11AC, it started well after the start of the task group. Well, this time it started beforehand. But it took them a long time to get to draft point one. All right, so that's just going to give us an idea of the realistic timelines here. Uh, and then from point one to m recently 1.0 took them quite a long time. So, even though the ta you know, even though the task group appears to be you know working kind of in line with the time frame of 11ac it's actually taking a lot more time uh, and we're going to see that because there's a lot more features in 11ax than there were in 11ac 11ac essentially did downlink multi-user mimo and did you know uh, 80 80 160 megahertz channels but nothing you know, theoretically uh, more you know, interesting than that. So 11AX, we're going to see a lot, lot, lot more features. It's just taking a lot of time to, 
to craft. Um, we, let's see, so we're predicting May for 2.0. That's never going to happen. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> there were, there were uh, 7,000 comments compared to 11AC, which had a couple thousand comments in draft 1.0. So, so if you look at how long it took to take 1.0 to 2.0 for 11AC, well, you know, so 1.0 hopefully maybe uh, to get the comments done, I don't know, maybe in the fall. So this is, you know, we were predicting a faster schedule in 11 AC to be done by the end of 2018, but it's, it's somewhere we're looking at 2019. Um, that said, we've seen now for 10 years that when the standard finish has really little re relevance to when the products come out. So, so that's, so 11N draft products came out at 2.0, 11AC came out at 3.0, so Wi-Fi Alliance is already starting the process of developing a certification plan. You know, uh, hopefully 2.0 and 3.0 will come out somewhere the first half of um, 2018, the spec, and then we can be certifying somewhere, you know, um, we're targeting 2018, but probably early 2019, because if you, again, now we look at the Wi-Fi Alliance certification plan, um, 11AC took uh, about 36 months, the, so the same time would put us uh, kind of the first half of 2019 to have a certification plan. I'm a little concerned this may slip as well because the number of features are much, much larger, um, and so the amount of uh, tests that need to be developed um, is going to push it to be much longer than a, develop, a certification development plan for 11AC but hopefully somewhere in the first half of 2019. Okay, so I keep on mentioning how many features there are on 11AX. So the problem with trying to present it is how do I, how do I group this such that we can kind of get a handle, you know, rather than a list of 100 features? How do, I, how do I put this together so you know, people can kind of get a feel for what we're trying to do? Um, so I, I, I tried to bucket the major features into categories of enhancements. Um, so I, you know, like 1111N and 11AC, we have spectral efficiency and, and throughput improvements. That's the upper left corner. Then to address density, we have features that are specifically uh, introduced to address high density. We have the outdoor longer range category, and then we have the power saving category. And we'll go into a little bit of detail since this is this was like a three-hour presentation that I cut down to one hour. So we'll go in a little bit of detail on on each of the main ones. Um, but it, but as a kind of high-level overview, we uh, so we're you know in terms of uh, you know kind of raw throughput, I, I took some liberties of putting eight by eight AP here. Uh, you could actually build that with eleven AC. Um, it wasn't very prevalent, if at all. We will be seeing. Uh, 8 and 10, 11 AX um, devices. We've allowed downlink multi-user MIMO to go up to eight clients, so you can really make good use of those eight, and, eight antennas. So I'm, I'm calling that a 2X improvement for 11, a, for 11 AX over 11 AC. You know, we're gonna increase our modulation to 1024 QAM. Um, raw data rate, you know, I, we, we can discuss how much range you get and, you know, so forth, but raw data rate, that's 25%. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna have uplink multi-user MIMO, so in 11AC we only had downlink, we're gonna have uh, uplink now, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'm gonna skip the OFDM symbol for a second here. So the next category is high density. So. We have OFDM as our basic uh, modulation, uh, modulation scheme for decades now. We're going to do OFDM access. Uh, we're going to split up subcarriers um, within a you know within a waveform to a bunch of different clients in parallel. I'll have slides on that. Um, that way we we you know we can transmit to more clients in, in parallel and and uh, get uh, efficiency improvement. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Because of that, we had to change our waveform structure. So uh, the uh, waveform uh, symbol length uh, increased so we can get more subcarriers. We then made it more efficient. The preamble is now more efficient. The, uh, the uh, subcarrier 
the count is more efficient, so we're going to get a raw, you know, just by doing the changes for OFDMA, we're going to actually get a, a, a data rate increase. So that's why long OFEM symbol straddles spectral efficiency and, and high density. Uh, I talked about overlapping BSSs. We're going we're to have a spatial reuse capability such that we can purposely reuse um, spectrum and treat it as uh, uh, not interference, <laughs> or, or r rather than defer, we can treat it as interference and, and then transmit over each other and hopefully increase, uh, increase capacity. Uh, next category, outdoor longer range. We're going to, since we have this long symbol, we can actually have longer guard intervals without hitting our efficiency. So we can you know, uh, increase our delay spread protection. We have a new uh, packet structure that we've uh, specifically designed to provide extended range. And then the last category is power saving. And we're going to borrow a feature from 11AH. Uh, that's, uh, I think, recently completed uh, uh, amendment to target the like, IoT and 900 megahertz band. You're going to hear me talk about that. Uh, you know, we can argue about you know, whether that's actually be used or not. But a lot of the features they, they added in AH, we're going to borrow in AX. So in that sense, it was a useful exercise, <laughs> whether or not it actually gets deployed. Um, so, so we have a sleep, uh, schedule sleep and wake time function in AH that we're going to use in AX to, to reduce the power consumption for devices that want to stay asleep sleep longer. And if you recall on 11AC, it was required for all the client devices to support 80 megahertz. Uh, we did that to just, man, you know, just mandate higher throughputs. We're going back on that. We're now in AX, we're going to allow 20 megahertz only devices, again, cost and power saving. So there's a 20 megahertz only feature as a kind of subclass to the clients. So that's the high level overview. We're going to, um, we're going to touch on each, um, uh, each of these features a little bit more in the upcoming slides. Hopefully I don't run out of time before I reach, reach all the, all the uh, features here. OK, OFDMA. Um, so this is, this is kind of one of the big, big new features for uh, dot 11. Um, in ter and, and we're introducing this to improve efficiency. So the biggest issue we're seeing um, with efficiency is when we have a whole bunch of short packets that we can't aggregate, then you get a lot of, you know, so you get a lot of clients transmitting short packets. The preamble is really, you know, uh, overhead is really high, right? If, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, 80 megahertz wide and you're sending 100 bytes and you just got a couple symbols, I mean, your, your data isn't much you know, your, your data time on air isn't much longer than your preamble time. So half, half your efficiency is gone just to the, the, the preamble. Um, all the contentions, interframe spacing, uh, that, really, that really hits you uh, badly if you, uh, again, lots of short packets, a lot of users, and you spend half your time just contending for the channel. So, so that's... Um, yeah, you know, so that's kind of the main issue we were trying to address with OFDMA. So, so we tried aggregation 11N. Um, you know, so packets that can be aggregated from a single client, that's great. We can get uh, we can get packets up to you know thousands of bytes, get the packet length uh, you know up to a mil, you know, millisecond. That that was that works really well. What do you do with voice over Wi-Fi? Right. I know in my home I have no cellular coverage. At work I have no cellular coverage. Um, most of the hotels I've stayed at, I have no cellular coverage. I'm almost 90-something percent on voice over Wi-Fi. So the problem is, if you don't want to kill your latency, your jitter, stuff like that, it's really hard to you know, aggregate these 100-byte packets. So if you get a lot of people you know, on, on voice over Wi-Fi, say corporate enterprise, um, you, know, it's, it's, you just have horrible efficiency. Uh, we did downlink multi-user MIMO. Okay, so we have a lot of users. We want to group some of them together. That improves efficiency. That also still works best, say, with you know, video streaming or somewhere you have a constant stream of high pa you know, large packets because you have the feedback that you have to you know, amortize o you know, over your transmissions. Um, so we did time, we did space, now we're doing uh, frequency. So, we, uh, so I have a little plot of here's a kind of a typical OFDM transmission that we have in you know, dot 11, you have a data preamble. This, this is pretty much the scale if you have you know, a really high data rate and short packets. Right? So you spend an enormous amount of time on preambles and on contention. Right? So if we can divvy up our frequency band into 
you'll say this is 80 megahertz and you give you know, 30 some clients each couple megahertz, right? Short packets, so it's not a big deal, right? You don't need 80 megahertz to transmit 100 bytes. So then you can, you can get all of these uh, uh, clients, users into one packet and then you amortize the preamble, you get rid of 30 something uh, contentions so you, um, you can group all of these uh, uh, acknowledgements into one multi-user block act, right? So you have the potential for pretty high improvement in efficiency. Um, and again, so what we're gonna have is a big toolkit of features to that, you know, the, the schedule or the AP or the controller or, or the client have to figure out what feature am I gonna use when? Am I gonna use, you know, aggregate 11N aggregation? Am I gonna use you know, downlink multi-user MIMO, am I gonna use OFDMA? So at least we have a, a whole toolkit on, on kind of optimizing the technique for the environment. So we're gonna introduce OFDMA on the downlink, so the access point when transmitting to a lot of clients can, um, can utilize this function. Unlike 11AC, we are also gonna do this on the uplink. So we're gonna do uplink uh, uh, multi-user capability. Uh, so so the, uh, on the uplink, we're gonna be able to group multiple users uh, together. Uh, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of different scenarios where we have to synchronize all these clients together. So that's the big complication. Um, OFDMA itself isn't, you know, isn't new. I mean, new to .11, but it's not new. And, but the complication there is the synchronizing all the clients on the uplink. Um, we're gonna have to do that for OFDMA. We're also gonna have to do that for multi uplink multi-user MIMO. Uh, another cool trick with OFDMA is you can optimize um, the, uh, the power on each individual client to kind of ma you know, balance or maximize your SINR per, uh, per user. Uh, so you can play with power across the band, right? If, you know, if you have you know, one user is kind of close up, you can give it less transmit power than a, you know, a client further away. Um, so we're gonna make use of that as well. Okay, so I took one example, uh, uh, 80 megahertz um, BSS. This is the different resource units that are, are gonna be um, uh, uh, capable of using. So we have the non-OFDMA. Uh, this is, we're gonna do a, a 1024 point FFT in, in 80 megahertz. Uh, we'll talk about the, uh, uh, the new waveform design later in the, in the phi section. So we, we have a nine, 996 tone uh, uh, waveform. This is approximately the full 80 megahertz. Then you can divide it up uh, down to about uh, to a 40 megahertz resource unit. That's 484 tones. There's a 20 megahertz resource unit. There's an 8 megahertz resource unit. There's a 4 megahertz resource unit, and then the, the smallest is a 2 megahertz resource unit. And so, in 80 megahertz, we can have 37 uh, of these 26 tone resource units. So, you can get as as many as 37 clients in parallel in a in a single packet. Uh, with OFDMA with uh, 80 megahertz BSS. Um, now you can mix and match these resource units. I mean the trick is you just can't overlap uh, in, uh, resource units um, in frequency here. So you can, you can have a, you know, a, a 40 megahertz here and then any combination over there. So it doesn't have to be uniform. You, you can pick any, any one. So you can mix, mix and match like a video client with a bunch of voice over Wi-Fi clients. I have a a slide next that shows a couple different um, uh, examples, right? So again, this is 80 megahertz. We have a 40, we have a 20, we have a, this looks like an eight, a four, and a couple twos. Here we have a different assignment. This is 16, right? We have a, a couple 20s, an eight, a four, and a whole bunch of uh, two megahertz uh, clients. So the, the key here is as long as they're not Overlapped, you can you can do any any arbitrary assignment, and it can be from packet to packet. You can do different clients, different assignments from packet to packet. So it's very flexible in that respect. Okay, so what is the gain uh, that we expect from this? Um, this was a you know, this was some uh, results from a presentation back in 2014. So we won't look at the exact details of the simulation because it's you know this was before. You know, we even you know, we haven't had an initial draft 
Um, but this just gives you an idea of the gain we expect from the general concept of OFDMA, right? So the, the simulations show, you know, when you have a lot of users, you know, just kind of vanilla OFDM throughput uh, compared to an implementation of OFDMA, and, and, these, and these, uh, uh, these, this presenter showed you know, a 300% uh, improvement in gain. It, and so it, it kind of matches what I showed here, just visually, right? You get rid of the contentions, you get rid of all these preambles, you can kind of see that you know, if, you get a, you know, if you can get a handful of clients aggregated together and, and you can um, you know, group, you know, group all their small data packets, that you can easily see you, know, you can get rid of a lot of the overhead and you, you can get the 300%. So this is our, you know, so we were, our goal was 4X. This is kind of the 3X part. We need another X. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting close just with OFDMA. Okay, so next is multi-user MIMO. Uh, we had this in 11AC. We're gonna enhance it in 11AX. Um, so we, we, you know, when we started with 11AX, we're like, okay, so how is 11AC working? Um, well, you know, we, you know, we kind of introduced a downlink multi-user MIMO and 11AC back in, I don't know, we were thinking about it in 2009 or something. So we've had, you know, we've had a number of years to think about it. We've had some products finally out, Wave 2 came out, so we've had some uh, experience in, in the field a little bit. Um, I know, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, clients, you know, single antenna, um, I've also seen a lot of some clients that are two antenna and switch to a uh, single stream when they do multi-user MIMO. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're going to have a four antenna AP and a two antenna single user client that only then switches to single antenna, then the gain for multi-user MIMO is kind of modest. Um, so that's where um, going up to eight antennas now you can start grouping a lot more clients together, right? If you only have, right, with two, with two antenna clients doing two streams, well, four antennas and uh, four streams is kind of marginal. It's nice to have an extra stream, yeah, extra antenna for, for diversity. Um, so eight antennas allows you to do, say, three two antenna, three clients, each two antenna to do six streams, or say six clients, all single stream. Then you can really see some, some large you know, downlink multi-user MIMO gain. Um, now with that, more clients means um, more overhead, right? We got to feed back you know, all the channel state information, right? So we need, a, we need a better way of getting feedback so it scales with the increased number of clients. Uh, the other thing we saw was, well, you know, you can be, you know, big file transfer on the, you know, on the down, downlink, but then you're kind of blocked uh, with uh, waiting for the TCP acts on the uplink, right? So, so in 11AC, we didn't have anything to, to enhance the uplink, so, uh, we were seeing, so, rel so if you compare UDP gain between single user and multi user, you know, downlink multi user MIMO, relative to TCP gain, the, you know, the downlink multi user MIMO with TCP gain was actually smaller, right? So we want to address that. So uplink techniques will help, will help balance the downlink, enhance downlink multi user MIMO. Um, so again, back in 2008, 2009, when we were discussing multi user MIMO in 11AC, we did discuss uh, uplink multi-user MIMO. There's a, there was quite a number of presentations on it if you look, go, go dig around on the re repository. Um, but it wasn't, it, you know, we weren't, uh, we, didn't inc impl you know, we didn't include it due to implementation concerns. Uh, I kind of hinted at that. You need to synchronize all the users um, and people were kind of scared of that. Now with doing uplink OFDMA and uplink multi-user MIMO, so there's, there's a, you know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of potential now, you know, to try to overcome the, uh, the synchronization issues, right? So, so it's not just one feature. We need the same synchronization for, you know, for two major features. Uh, so with that, 11AX is going to include uplink multi-user MIMO. We're going to, uh, we can use that for grouping sounding frames to help downlink. Uh, data frames, uh, and we can, you know, just like um, in downlink, we can do that in uplink, we can group, uh, we can group multiple users together to increase, you know, the maximum throughput. So OFDMA is in, about improving efficiency, but uplink multi-user can improve maximum data rates. So that's, uh, that's a benefit there. And then we change, you know, we're allowing groups up to eight clients. Uh, so so now, now even if with single stream, 
a single antenna clients, you can group up to eight, probably will do up to six, right, to save a couple antennas for diversity. And, and so then you can get, you know, uh, you know, upwards of say 6x increase in over you know, single user, um, and then probably a 2x increase over 11AC uh, multi-user MIMO. Now, for, uh, um, in the downlink and then uplink will be new. Okay, so this is the one and only slide. <laughs> I have a mathematical background, so I like to throw one slide on math. Um, I'm not gonna make you analyze it much. Basically what I wanted to show is that um, the, the mathematical construct of just plain vanilla MIMO, right? You have a two antenna client, you have a two antenna AP, you have paths from each antenna. Um, you get your Y equals uh, H, X plus uh, noise um, uh, formulation. If, so uplink multi-user MIMO, say you just separate those two antennas into two different clients, that's uplink multi-user MIMO in, in a nutshell. And the math doesn't change at all. So, so my point here is that uplink multi-user MIMO is mathematically equivalent to uplink uh, uh, single-user MIMO. Right? Because we're used to thinking about downlink multi-user MIMO where you have to do feedback, you have to cal you know, calculate antenna weights, it's really complicated. Uh, this is really simple, mathematically. Though the problem is it's a lot harder to implement in practice because to, to actually achieve this equation, you have to eliminate all of the mismatch in in uh, time synchronization, frequency misalignment, power normalization, right? Otherwise, you have a lot of other variables in this equation to, to model the uh, time errors, frequency errors, power errors between the, the clients uh, in the group, right? And the downlink, AP sends to, you know, AP has this entirely, you know, has a single clock, power amplifier, everything's, you know, everything's nice and pretty. Uplink, um, every client's different and so we have to do a lot, of, you know, a lot of effort in just synchronizing. But the math is really simple. Uh, so we're gonna have a protocol to address this for both uplink OFDMA, because it's the same issue with OFDMA. You have right, multiple users in the same group with different sub carriers. They need to be frequency aligned, they need to be time aligned, they need to be power aligned. So, so we, need a, we need a synchronization sys scheme for both OFDMA and multi-user MIMO, and so then we, we took it on finally in 11AX. Okay, so, so what does the protocol look like? So this is the uplink multi-user operation. This applies to both OFDMA and multi-user MIMO. So we're introducing a new trigger frame. So a new control frame, it's called the trigger. Um, it specifies the length of the uplink window. It specifies the users that may send during the uplink window. It uh, allocates the resources. Um, for all the, you know, the, the PPDUs, the packets in, uh, that each, uh, for each station. So it's the resource unit if you're doing OFDMA, it's the you know, spatial streams if you're doing MIMO, multi-user MIMO, the modulation coding screen, scheme. Essentially what we're seeing is the AP taking over complete control of, of the BSS now, right? Because in, in, you know, up to today, the clients decide what they want to do on the uplink. With the uplink multi-user, the AP decides everything now. The client just needs to send its packet, not do any thinking whatsoever. The AP will tell it what to do. Um, so from an AP vendor, that's great, right? Because <laughs> we have all sorts of problems with you know, weird, you know, weird heuristics on the client side. So now the AP can take over and everything's gonna work much, much better. Um, you know, one little plug. But, the, <laughs> but uh, so as I, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, we need uh, the trigger to support uh, transmission time, sync, frequency, s uh, sampling, symbol clock, power pre-correction. So all of that, the, the stations get off this trigger frame. So then, then we, you know, once we get all the packets sent to the AP, then we need to acknowledge all that. So again, right, we have a multi-user coming to the access point the access point now needs to do a multi-user uh, multi acknowledgement. So we can do that in a couple different ways. You know, dot 11, we, we like to have five ways of doing the same thing. We'll see in Wi-Fi lines what gets certified, and that will, that will typically mean the one feature that actually gets implemented. So a couple of ways we have in the standard is that the, um, we can do a downlink multi-user transmission. So the AP can send a downlink multi-user transmission and individually address a block act to each, to each client. That's one way. The other way is a new multi-station block act. 
which can then be sent in either a legacy 11A format or, or in a new uh, multi-user uh, PPDU. So, so there's a couple different ways. Um, then this, so besides the basic frame ex data frame exchange, we can use this trigger to uh, also be a beam forming report poll. So again, I said we could use this uplink structure for helping downlink multi-user MIMO. So this trigger could be a beamforming report poll. This can be all of the uh, compressed feedback from all the clients if we want to then do a downlink, downlink multi-user MIMO transmission right after that. So imagine with six, six clients transmitting feedback, rather than 10 milliseconds in time, this is now just you know, one, one, you know, like, you know, one or half a, half a millisecond. So a huge improvement to downlink multi-user MIMO by doing a uh, parallel transmission of the feedback. Um, so, and, there's, you know, and then there's gonna be other, other aspects of the, of the amendment that we use this trigger rating for. We're gonna have, a, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we have a multi-user block act request to get a block act response. We can, we're gonna have a new multi-user RTS, CTS. Um, other reports can all be place in this trigger frame where you want a multi-user transmission back. So it's gonna be a very useful, useful tool here for all of our uplink uh, transmissions. Okay, so how does, how does this work? Um, or how well does this work? So again, I grabbed a, a, couple, a couple simulation slides from uh, some presentations that were given in DOT 11. This is, again, this is from 2015. So the exact details of the simulation may not quite match, but the general concept uh, will, be, uh, you know, will be accurate. We have a couple different simulations, one with 1,000 byte uh, MSDUs, so 1,000 byte, uh, I'm sorry, 1,500 byte packets, and then a simulation with 36 byte packet. So this is what I was talking about at the very beginning. You know, how does performance compare with your large packets versus small packets? And this is kind of start giving you an idea of when would you use what feature where. So for downlink multi-user, right, we have, um, so this is the single, you know, this is single user performance on both sides. So with large packet sizes, right, it's really best to use multi-user MIMO. Think about video streaming to multiple clients. Um, you know, you really, you'll, or, or large file transfers. So that's the best case for multi-user MIMO, especially in, in higher SNRs. Um, OFDMA, uh, you don't get as much efficiency gain. If you already have large packets and you don't have a lot of clients, that's not really the best case for OFDMA. Now, if you have um, you know, moderate SNR and then small packet sizes and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of clients, you know, you're, you're seeing almost, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, I was call it 70, you know, 60, 70 percent gain of OFDMA over multi-user MIMO in that case, right? You're just, you're just not going to see a lot of gain if you have a lot of users and small clients with multi-user MIMO. But, but uh, oh, that's the perfect, you know, uh, scenario to use for OFDMA. So small packets, you know, uh, pretty large gain over, especially over single user with OFDMA. Now, similarly, on the uplink, uh, again, for, you know, kind of ignore all the details, you know, here at Scheme 1, Scheme 2. This was a presentation, you know, when we were still working on how to, um, you know, codify the technique. But similarly, you know, on the uplink, you know, 1500 by packet, you want to choose, you know, multi, in a higher SNR, you want to choose multi-user MIMO. Uh, smaller, you know, smaller uh, packet sizes, again, you see uh, OFDMA out, outperforming multi-user MIMO. Okay, so we did a lot of the density. We did the, you know, the, the uh, uh, spectral efficiency. We're, um, so we're now looking at, with uh, multi-user techniques. Now we're gonna look at the, the other category is spatial reuse. So how do we deal with the OBSS? That's kind of in general. Right now we treat it as you defer, right? So if someone else is transmitting, you don't transmit. Um, so, uh, so what happens um, if you have a dense deployment? Well, you, you know, like we see in stadiums, you drop everything down to 20 megahertz, you try to minimize your reuse, right? So, so you're, you're, you're capped on your network capacity in essentially 20 megahertz uh, per BSS. 
Right, so if you, I don't know, if you mu multiply that by the maximum data rate, you can get a, your maximum capacity pretty quickly. Um, so how do, you, how, do you how do you increase the capacity? Well, you want to go to, say, 40 or 80 megahertz. Now, the problem with that is, say, like a 5 gigahertz, if we have to drop down to, say, you know, five or four channels, I use four here just because it's easier to plot, then, yes, you have an, a 4x increase in your network capacity from a raw, spectr raw spectrum calculation. But as we all know, you're going you're, you're gonna to be blocked by all these, uh, especially dense deployment, smaller, uh, smaller um, uh, BSS sizes. Right, you're going to hear all of these other BSSs, and so you're going to defer for all of them. So, you know, in, in the best case, you would just be back to 20, the 20 megahertz performance because you're just you know, using a quarter of the airtime. In the worst case, is you're, content, you're having collisions uh, and all your contentions be, you know, between the co-channel, you know, co co-frequency BSSs, and you actually end up worse than if you were just using 20 megahertz. And that's why we, you know, we see like in stadiums or conference, you know, the large auditoriums were like, okay, well, let's just use the smallest bandwidth and, and minimize uh, reuse, right? So, so how do we, you know, so how do we, you know, address this? Um, so again, I I, I mentioned 802.11ah. So 802.11ah, um, you know, even though it was at 900 megahertz, they were thinking about similar concepts in terms of you're going to have long transmission range, so a lot of OBSS, lots of uh, clients. So they were also thinking in terms of how to uh, manage OBSS differently than, we, than the typical just deferral. Uh, and so they introduced a, key, a scheme called BSS coloring, uh, and I have it pictured over here. So you can assign a different color per BSS, that way you can distinguish between uh, co-channel BSSs. So with coloring, you see that this, you can now view that this co-channel BSS here, all these ones, are now uh, not your BSS. So now you can have different rules based on, on detection uh, of, of uh, transmissions from those BSSs. And so what may those rules look like, right? So you re, you know, as a receiver, this can be AP or the client, you, you, know, you receive the signal, is it above minus, you know, we'll, we'll just talking 20 megahertz numbers. So is it above minus 82 dBm? Yes. Is, you know, did you decode it pro the, the preamble properly? Yes. So it's a, it's a dot 11 packet. It's greater than minus 82 dBm. So we added a step. Is it the same color? N uh, so yes, then that's, that's another client in your BSS transmitting you're going to defer. If it's not your color, that's a different BSS. So now I can say, well, Rather than minus 82 dBm, maybe I'll do a detection level of minus 62 dBm. The signal's coming in at minus 72. Now I can, I can treat it as it didn't occur. So, so, so what is that bias? Well, if you're you know, dense deployment, you're close to the AP, you've got 40 dB SNR, maybe you can handle a little bit of interference and, and have an SINR of, say, 30 dB, still get high MCS. If we can go from 20 megahertz to 80 megahertz, now, this is still hypothetical, but if we could, that's 4x. Even if you take a 50% hit on your modulation coding, you're still getting a pretty big net capacity increase to your system. So that's the goal, right? It'll, we'll, you know, we're still going to wait. You know, we have to actually try to you know, apply this in practice, but that's the goal, and that's what the technique in dot eleven is going to eleven ax is going to allow us to to play around with. So, you're going to you're going to allow you know, we're going to have the ability now, rather than have fixed detection level, to have an adjustable uh, uh, signal detect level. It's going to be adaptive because obviously you don't want devices that are transmitting a really high power to set. You know, really aggressive. You, know, you don't want to be transmitting at 25 dBm and then detecting at minus 62 d, uh, 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 minus 62 uh, dBm, right? So, so we're going to have a sliding scale. So, the higher you transmit, then the the more you know the more conservative you have to be. So, you know, at 20 something dBm, you'll be at your typical minus 82 dBm. Now, if you scale down your power, um, uh, somewhere around you know 10ish dB. Uh, transmit power, you'll be allowed to detect at minus 62. So you'll be allowed to be more aggressive on your 
trans on your transmission if your transmit powers are lower. So that actually works out pretty well in dense deployments because we re we typically ratchet our powers down anyways, and so now we can kind of you know we can ignore the OBSSs rather than deferring. Um, so just to kind of give you a taste of what the at least simulated capability again this is from 2014 so the exact parameters of the sim simulation don't necessarily match what we have in the in the standard but um, but it gives you an indication what what we're hoping to achieve um, I'm just going to point out so this is this is the fifth uh, percentile throughput so this is kind of like the five percent worst clients in the BSS. Um, if, you, if, you're, if they were, which, which would be arguably the most impacted by interference. So if you can enhance them, then, you're, you, know, then you have uh, expectation of really getting uh, a, a large improvement to, uh, with uh, spatial reuse. So the, uh, the nominal signal detect level of minus 82, you, I don't know, in, in whatever their uh, uh, scenario was, they ended up with about I don't know, 0.75 megabits per second. This, you know, with going up to minus 62 dBm, they, they got like the one point, um, I don't know, seven, seven five. so more than double the throughput uh, in, in, in this case. We see similarly for the average throughput here on the downlink, we're getting, you know, we're getting a, uh, from, from, uh, from minus 80 to minus 60, we're getting uh, uh, over a double uh, uh, increase in, in network capacity. Um, so that's what we're so that's what we're go, uh, we're, we're uh, targeting and we're hopeful for with with spatial reuse. Uh, so so it's actually a dramatic change in the last 20 years where we had a fixed C, uh, fixed detection fixed CCA. All right. So this is uh, this is quite a departure from that, and there's been a lot of discussions on on how to. Um, how to deploy this, and, and actually even how to s specify this, because in draft 1.0, there was um, no way for the access point to uh, control how the clients do this, and so there's a lot of comments on, you know, it's like, well, maybe the, you know, since, since at the controller network level, you, you, you set up your, you know, you set up your BSS at a certain size, and we don't really want clients doing arbitrary things, and and uh, you know, and transmitting at you know, or de detecting you know at, at levels that um, won't fit with our plan. So hopefully, you know, hopefully there'll be a lot, a lot more control when we have uh, draft 2.0. So, so that's why at the very beginning of the slide, I said this this presentation is on 1.0. So hopefully, we're going to get some improvement <laughs> to the text and spatial reuse, and then it's going to you know it'll be a powerful feature uh, in the in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna have to speak faster, I think, right? Yeah, <laughs> about 20 minutes of slides to do in nine minutes. Okay, so physical layer enhancements. Um, so in the literature, I've started, I started seeing the, the term long OFDM symbol, so I'm using it here. I really don't like that. Um, you know, what we did is, you know, we, we decided we're gonna do OFDMA. You know, think about it, for the last 20 years, we've had 64 point FFT, we've had you know, 48, 52 data tones in 20 megahertz. If you want to divide that up by a bunch of clients, you don't have the granularity, right? So, so we needed more tones uh, in 20 megahertz to get finer granularity. If you think about it, if you wanted like, at least one pilot tone per user, um, you know, then you, ne you need enough data tones to amortize that, that overhead due to, you know, just to be able to track your, you know, track your face. So we had to, you know, we, 64 point FFT in 20 megahertz just wasn't gonna work for OFDMA. So we decided on, after a lot of simulations comparing 256, 512, 1024, we decided on 256 uh, point FFT in 20 megahertz. You heard me mention 1024 and 80 megahertz. So it's a, you know, it's a, it'll be a factor of two for every factor of two increase in bandwidth. Um, but looking at 256 point FFT and 20 megahertz, um, we are, um, once we've chosen that, then that means a 4x decrease in the frequency separation between the subcarriers. So why didn't we do that you know, 20 years ago? Well, it, you know, um, OFDM started in 11A at five gigahertz. It was pretty high cost, right? We needed to give ourselves you know, the clocks for five gigahertz were costly, you know, so on. So we need to give ourselves a lot of slop. 20 years later, we can do things a lot, a lot more cost effective, a lot more efficient. 
you know, we believe we can handle frequency space, spacing now that's a, a fourth, so down to 78.125 kilohertz. What does that mean? In, so in the frequency domain, we, you know, we, uh, we increase the, or we decrease the spacing. That means it increases the symbol time, long OFDM symbol. So when you go, you know, with, with uh, 11A, you had a 3.2 microsecond OFDM symbol. We're going to 12.8 microsecond symbols. So that's the long symbol. So once we've done that for OFDMA, now what else benefits can we get out of that? We get, um, we get improvement in the spectral efficiency. So we had 48 data tones in 11A and 11G. We upped that to 52 in 11N. Uh, so going from 75% uh, spectrally efficient to 81%. In 11AX, we'll have 234 data tones in 250, out of 256. That's 91% efficient. So, so, that's part, you know, so that's part of the efficiency now with this new waveform. We, uh, in time, right, so, so we're, we're going from 3.2 to 12.8. When we add the preamble, right, so the same 0.8 microsecond preamble that we had in 11A and 11G gave us an 80% uh, uh, symbol efficiency. We upped that to 89% by going to the half, guard, the half guard interval with the 0.4 microseconds. Now 11AX, even going back to just 0.8 as your minimum, that's 94% of, of uh, symbol efficiency. And then we can go all the way up to a 3.2 microsecond guard interval to handle the delay spread that I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Still being the same efficiency as we had you know, with, you know, with the basic 0.8 microsecond in 11N, 11N. Uh, in 11A. Uh, so, so lots of benefit from changing the waveform, right? It was, again, it was originally done for OFDMA, but we're getting a lot of extra benefit. And you'll see that in, in what, you know, what we can do for outdoor, we can see that in the data rates as well. Okay, so outdoor longer range, uh, as I said, that was one of the major goals. Uh, we are, you know, with the new symbol structure, we can now have uh, a delay spread um, with, you know, within the 3.2 microsecond guard interval. So that really, you know, that really addresses one of the, you know, bigger issues with the typical dot 11 waveform is, is, you know, is kind of the indoor preambles, you know, indoor guard interval size. So that, that will, um, you know, that will really improve, uh, you know, detection capability in, in the longer range outdoor. We also have a feature that's TBD right now. Um, so I, don't, I can't really talk about more about it, but there is a bit in the preamble that says Doppler mode. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, uh, my hypothesis is we've had, we've had uh, channel models for a uh, decade now where we have a you know, pedestrian walking outdoors and bounces coming off fast moving vehicles. So some of, you know, some of your paths are now have this high Doppler. We're, we're not addressing, you know, an individual with Wi-Fi driving and, and trying to you know, connect to, um, to, to AP. So we're not trying to, you know, to do cellular mobility, but outdoors with this Doppler component to, the, uh, to, to your uh, received signal, then there'll be some, uh, some undefined mode. Again, looking at 11AH, they had a technique uh, where the, uh, the pilots from symbol to symbol in the packet um, shift uh, shift to position. So that means you could track the channel during the packet. So with Doppler on one of your taps of, of your, uh, of your uh, multipath, then you can, um, you can track that out during the packet. So that's not an 11AX, but since we're, you're, you're hearing about a bunch of things we borrowed from AH, that's possibly what could be, you know, how this Doppler bit could be used to indicate maybe, you know, traveling pilots. We'll see. So, um, so that's, so that's the uh, handling the, the channel. Now the uh, coverage, we have a new packet format called extended range. Uh, quickly here, we have um, the, the short and long training fields are boosted by 3 dB. So it gives you 3 dB extra coverage on the, on the short and long training fields. The signal fields are doubled in length, so you can, you can do a you know, combining gain of 3 dB. And then, uh, so that means your entire preamble now is uh, 3 dB better than your, your normal uh, packet transmissions. We also have a technique called dual carrier modulation. 
Light, so in 11N, we added space-time block coding. That takes two antennas, transmit the same thing from the two antennas, combine it, uh, you get gain. Here, we take two subcarriers, transmit the same thing, so you can do combining in frequency. So similar concept, diversity gain by replicating the data on you know, different medium. So, so SDBC is spatially, DCM is frequency. So that's uh, simulations have shown three and a half dB gain there. Uh, then there's a mode that you can also transmit uh, in a 106 tone resource unit, so eight megahertz, which means you can get another, uh, you know, three-ish dB of uh, noise bandwidth gain, right? So there's, there's a whole bunch of little features in, the, in this packet format to extend the, you know, the, the, the maximum coverage, um, you know, let's say outdoors. Okay, 1024 QAM, we have um, you know, eight bits per symbol versus 10 from 11AC to 11AX. Uh, the, we, we're going from, a, tr so talk about it, the transmitter complexity, we're gonna go from a minus 32 dB EVM to a minus 35. Uh, what's the range? We're going from 20 megahertz minus 57 dBm to minus 52 dBm detection uh, at 20 megahertz and then and then uh, another 6 dB uh, at 80 megahertz. So kind of give you an idea of what range we expect with that. New phi rates, so there's zillions of rates now. So rather than go through all the rates, here's a table. You have to, in your head, have to do the multiplication by the number of streams. Uh, we have um, you know, up to eight streams for both 11AC and 11AX. I've compared, say for 20 megahertz, you have a, we're, we're going from um, 86.7 to 143. You'll remember you can't do 5.6 uh, coding in, uh, with 2.6 QAM and 11 AC. We've got rid of that restriction. So now we're, we have a 65% increase in gain. We have about a 40% increase in, in, uh, in maximum data rate uh, with 40, 80, 160. On the flip side, you know, our minimum data rate, again, if we start addressing you know, IoT or something with AX, you know, you, these devices don't need that higher data rate. How much more time are you gonna give me? <laughs> I need probably like five more minutes. <laughs> so, okay, so, um, so we're, we're you know, with OFDMA, with the 26 tone RU, with MCS zero, with one space stream, with, with DCM, we're down to you know, 306, 375 kilobits per second. So that's, that's a, you know, you know uh, an IoT device, even a voice over IP, you don't need a gigabit per second, right? So if you really want a bunch of low data rate devices efficiently, that's, you know, that's plenty. So, so, you know, so that's, that's a radical departure from 11 and 11 AC of max data rate, max data rate. Well, now we're at min data rate. Okay. One last section, I'm gonna go through this really fast because I'm way over. Power saving, so that's that last category. So we borrowed a, a concept from 11AH again because they had, you know, that was IoT. They wanted all the devices to sleep as often as possible so they could get comparable power numbers to say Bluetooth and Zigbee, right? So they have a technique called target wake time. Basically, the AP and the client negotiate a sleep period and then when the client's gonna wake up for transmission. Um, so rather than normal dot 11 where you know you can you know kind of normal power saving dot 11 you you're asleep you got to wake up for beacons all the time right if you if you're a sensor and you're only transmitting once every couple minutes you know, waking up for the beacons kills your battery right that it's not the data transmission it's the, it's waking up to get beacons so we're skipping all that right so basically we jump down to the targeted wake time where the AP and the client negotiate. It's gonna wake up a certain time. The client's gonna transmit its data. Uh, it's going to receive a block act. The data, the, the AP may transmit down. Uh, it then transmits block act, done, right? So, so now we get rid of all of the battery consumption from all of the management overhead that was, you know, was aff, you know, afflicting dot 11 for kind of IoT devices. So that all came from 11AH. So 11AX is taking that basic uh, construct, um, but now since we have uplink multi-user MIMO or uplink OFDMA, it's like, well, you know, we, when, when the device wakes up, it doesn't have to be one device, it can be a bunch of devices, right? So, so during, this, you know, during this period, you can start with the trigger frame. So, a, so in this uplink period, the AP starts the trigger frame, 
bunch of clients transmit, um, and then you continue on. So that's one change. Uh, another change is um, rather than individual nego uh, individually negotiated schedules between the clients and the AP, uh, there's a broadcast mechanism uh, where, where, you know, where you don't have a pre-negotiated uh, uh, agreement between the AP and client. Uh, people are arguing that will scale better. Um, uh, again, we have now lots of options of doing the same thing, so we'll have to see what, the key will be what will, what will Wi-Fi line certify, and that will dictate what actually gets implemented. So I mentioned 20 megahertz only clients, right? So now we have the uh, permission to build 20 megahertz only you know, dual band clients. We, this was always a, you know, this is, this is always true in 2.4, but say you want, you know, like a watch, you know, you don't need, you know, 80 megahertz to communicate between a watch and, and your phone, right? So now you can build, you know, but you may want, you know, five gigahertz to have a much cleaner spectrum. So this allows us to build a 20 megahertz only, you know, such type device. Um, so the, you know, the question is, how do we deal with these devices now that we have, you know, we have a bunch of devices that are now not capable of 80 megahertz. Um, so the, the, we're, we have a protocol where the 20 megahertz only devices um, only communicate on the primary 20 megahertz. So I've plotted 40, but this extends to 80 or 160. Um, so you can have a, a, a packet exchange of just these clients. They're in the primary. You can have a packet exchange of normal clients. They'll, they'll spread the whole bandwidth. You can mix them. So again, in a mix, you have your 20 megahertz only clients in the primary. You have your normal clients in the you know, upper secondary. And then you can further mix and match. You can have some you know, normal clients in your primary. You can have your 20 megahertz only in your primary. And then you can have all the rest of the normal clients in your secondary. So it's very flexible. The key is that these 20 megahertz only devices you know, um, only have to operate in the primary 20. So that's, we believe, it will be a major power and, and cost saver to those type of, of devices. And last. We have a few other power saving features. In 11 AC, we had uh, the operating mode notification that allows a client to, for various reasons, to you know, scale down in streams or scale down in bandwidth. We have something similar called a receive operating mode. Now 11 AC, this, this is a management exchange. So that takes overhead, that takes power. Now this is just a, you know, uh, a field in the MAC header of a data frame. So as a client, I transmit a data packet, I go, Subsequent packets, I'm, going, I'm dropping down to one stream, I'm dropping down to 20 megahertz because I want to either have interference, I want to save power for, because my battery, you know, my battery is low. Um, so I don't have to go through a whole management ex exchange. I just, it's just a field in, my, in, the, Mac, uh, in the Mac header. So it's, uh, it's, it's much more efficient, both in spectral efficiency and power efficiency. Similarly, we have this, uh, the same capability on, on transmit. Extra uh, information is that the client can opt out of uplink multi-user MIMO, say you know, it, it doesn't want to deal with uh, you know, the synchronization and so forth. We can also use the BSS color as power saving. You see a packet that's not from your BSS, you can choose to just go to sleep. Okay, so that helps you. Again, barred from 11AH, we have a bit in the preamble that says it's uplink or downlink. As a client, I know that all, up, all other uplink traffic isn't for me, it's for the AP. So if I see a, in the preamble a bit that says, uh, uplink, I can go to sleep again for the duration of the preamble. And that wraps up a really quick high-level overview of, 11, of what you're going to see in 11AX. <laughs> <laughs>